Hello and welcome to the MRS Conservation Commission meeting. The date is June 12, 2024. The time is 7.03. We have all members present tonight and staff, Aaron Jock, Dave Zomick, may be joining us later, but he is not with us tonight um, for now. Um, okay, so jumping in, first up on the agenda is uh, comments from me. Um, I just wanted to check in about the land use subcommittee. Um, two things are that for the January or June 26th meeting, we expect to distribute a, the agricultural use policy to everybody. Um, that one is pretty much done and good to go. So rather than putting it forth in its entirety, we're thinking about um, sort of like section by section, just a little bit less to um, bite off at a time. Um, and so we'll probably just give that to everybody and you can review it at your leisure, I don't know, over like a two or three week time period and get comments back to us. And then we'll probably have a separate discussion for each of the sections. Um, and I guess the other thing is that we'll probably be seeking an extension for the subcommittee next meeting, um, probably six months. Um, so that is that's coming up. I don't know, Alex, if you wanted to chime in anything, but I think that's essentially what we wanted to get across. Alex isn't there. Um, okay. I think I'll just go straight to you for the open space plan updates, Erin. Bruce has a question, Michelle. Oh, sorry, Bruce, go ahead. On the first meeting agenda said you were gonna discuss the meeting, summer meeting schedule. Oh yeah, um, I'll just I'll just uh, make a quick statement on that. So this happens every summer um, that at some point I'd like to take like a week off, and um, uh, I'm looking right now at the first full week in August. So it's not the week of August first, but I believe it's the week of August eighth. So it's it would mean that we miss our first meeting in August, and that's usually mm -hmm. the week I take. Um, but it kind of gives the commission a little bit of a break in the summer to cancel a meeting. Um, so that would kind of be my recommendation unless the commission feels strongly that they want to schedule a second meeting or we have a ton of business in August. Erin, you mean the week of August 5th? Uh, yes, the week right. of August 5th to the 8th or yeah. 5th to the, yeah. yeah. I'm fine with just canceling and giving everyone a break in the summertime. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I see no objection, so we'll just move forward with that. Um, Aaron, do you want to do minutes before we jump into the open space plan? Or That would be great. Okay. Um, me, sorry, I'm not sure where my PowerPoint went. Bear with me just a second. <clears throat> Are we recording? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so we have minutes from May 8th and May 22nd, 2024. I'm looking for a motion to approve the draft minutes unless there's any comments or edits. I'll move to approve the draft minutes from 5824 and 52224. <clears throat> I'll second that. Andre on the motion. Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Rachel? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, great. Um, okay. Why don't I, I see that it's a bit out of order, but Aaron, just because we don't have Dave with the director's report, why don't you just go with the the staff updates on the open space plan? Okay. Um, so um, just the, the open space and recreation plan, as you guys know, we started, town staff started working on the plan um, back in October of last year. Um, the, the staff person who had been sort of the, the main um, lead on getting it accomplished um, ended up moving on to a different position. So I was asked to kind of step in um, and try to run with it and get it to the finish line by the end of June, which um, it was 
handed to me sort of at the end of May. So it's been uh, kind of a, a a little bit of a uh, a draw on my time to to work on it, but we're we're making great progress. Um, we do have a couple um, public information sessions that have already happened. We had one last Thursday at the uh, at Puffer's Pond for two hours. We had one at Groff Park last Friday for two hours. We've got two more upcoming information sessions. One our uh, sort of public outreach sessions, I guess. Um, one is at Mill River on Thursday from 2 to 4, and then um, this Friday at Amethyst Brook from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, I'm hoping next Friday to have a clean draft of the document to share, but that's very am a very ambitious goal. Um, it might end up being um, closer to the meeting that I'm able to share a copy of it with you all and also share publicly. Um, but the the hope is that at the meeting on the 26th, we would essentially have a public a public comment period where folks could comment on particularly the action items and the five-year action plan that's associated with uh, the plan itself. Um, most of the information is taken from the, the survey that we conducted. Um, the Open Space and Recreation Plan Survey, also the public information sessions have been a huge input of information from the public. And then, um, so CONCOM is going to have a public information session, Planning Board is going to have a public information session, and also the Recreation Committee will have a public information session. And the results from those information sessions, um, any results we get or comments we get from the public, we'll try to integrate into the plan before the end of June but I'm happy to take questions about it, um, where it's at and anything anyone wants more information on. Thanks, Erin. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Um, let's jump into land use applications. Um, first up is the pollinator research. I don't see anybody here for that, but if you are, raise your hand. Um, so just briefly, this is mostly observational. There's a couple of collections of bees. It's at uh, Wentworth Farm. There's a couple transects. Um, they're going to be looking at plant composition and um, bee disease or parasitoids or something. Um, and they've asked to flag the transects, which I just assume is just with the flagging. So I have no issues with this. I'd be really interested in a write-up of the results though. Um, we've been talking about Wentworth and management there and potential different uses such as agriculture. So it would be interesting to sort of get an inventory of the, the pollinator plants that are present. Any questions from the commissioners about this one? I would say I think it's a multi-year study, Erin, or is it just several times over the course? Sorry, I, I don't recall from looking at the application, but I have been asking um, that research projects that are multi-year come back um, okay. the second year just to re-up their, their permit because the purpose of the land use applications are to only be valid for up to a year. So. Okay, so I'm seeing that this is June to September 24 and 25. So we'll just want to relay that to them. Okay. Um, and just take down the flagging at the end of the sampling period. Okay, any questions on that one? This is the UMass Pollinator Project 2024. Okay, if not looking for a motion to approve the land use application for UMass Pollinator Research. I'll approve that application uh, for UMass Pollinator Research. I second. Laura on the motion, Rachel on the second. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, um, next up is Which wedding is it? Um, I think the September one was first. Okay, 922. Um, 
Is this the two person one? Uh, no, the 922 one is the 50 person one. Okay. All right. Um, so can I just see a show of hands of who reviewed this one? Okay. One, two, three. Okay. Um, so then briefly, this is a wedding application in September. The number of people are 50. Um, they have requested the use of, or to be able to use a golf cart to transport people and uh, equipment. Um, the equipment includes an awning, chairs for everybody, and an altar. So I'll just say that that's, that kind of gave me pause. That's a lot of people and um, the motorized vehicles are not allowed in conservation land. So um, I'm interested in commissioner comments. Laura, go for it. I feel like I've commented on this issue quite a bit. While I love the idea of people using public land um, for like small events, um, you know, I've, I, my history, my experience has been, I've gone, I've gone to Mount Pollux when there was an event there and 50 people is a lot of folks. Um, so I think this group just needs, would need to get comfortable with the notion that when you have a wedding for 50 people, it really is not then open to the public. So, you know, I think that for me, that would be, that's the deciding factor, you know, a 50 person wedding with um, a motorized vehicle and certainly no other room for parking. It means that for the duration of the wedding, no one from the public will feel comfortable going there. So, yeah. So I know, de facto close the public. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what, it, I mean, that's my perspective. I know before Aaron, you and Dave and I had spoken about, I forget how many conservation commissions passed, but the idea of like, I don't know. Anyway, so I'm going to stop there. Thanks, Laura. I think Andre was next. Yeah. Um, I'll piggyback on what Laura said. It's, uh, I think uh, I think this one has uh, gone beyond the max uh, of everything for me. Um, you know, uh, carrying, uh, having to use a vehicle to get uh, an altar out there to set up, uh, and then all the awning and so on, and fifty people is just sounds like it's just it's too much for a place like that. I just I don't, you know, we gotta we gotta. Yeah, I think we do need to set up some kind of guidelines at some point. But I, I disagree with uh, with having. I, I wouldn't like to approve that. Approve it the way it is, at least. Thanks, uh, Bruce. I guess mine is an observation, and I don't know if it's relevant. But I drove by Mount Pollux the other day on a Sunday, in uh, like at one o'clock, and there was a sign saying "event" pointing up the road, and there was a huge number of cars in that. There's some kind of a parking area on the, the main road to the east. And I don't know if it was at Mount Pollux, but it's hard to know where else it would have been up there. Um, so A, did anybody get a permit for that? And B, is that would be an example of a fairly large event. Mm -hmm. I can't recall off the top of my head if we had approved something for- I, I didn't know either. And I didn't go up there to- snoop around but i it was pretty big what was the date of that bruce oh i would have to go back and look it up but it, i felt like it was a sunday okay. could have been saturday okay i would have to double check if there had been a, an event but, but the I point wonder. is it was pretty you know there was a lot of activity mm -hmm. so yep Aaron, um i i want commissioners to comment but i i want to circle back when everybody's done Okay, I just want to throw something out as we're talking about it is that currently in the policy, we don't explicitly have a, a person limit or um, a restriction on things. So, um, you know, per weddings and until we develop that, I just want to, to put that on the table that we have to deliberate it with, you know, on a fair basis and, um, you know, per impacts and, and what our current land use regulations are. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, I wanted to note that um, Mount Pollux, lovely, um, is a, has different areas. So, um, you know, we say Mount Pollux, and a lot of people think of the the top, the view of the trees, but there are there is a, like a lower field below the parking area with trails. 
Um, and I, I'm just curious if if um it's not the scenic view for the for the wedding photos, but I'm wondering if um if there are specific areas on the property that um would be more suitable for events of different sizes, if that was something you want to think about. Thanks, Rachel. Laura? Yeah, I think um uh I think we should I feel like Aaron has come up quite a bit that we should probably take a stab at developing some kind of policy or rules around this. My my sensitivity is always, you know, the town of Amherst just spent a considerable amount of money buying, you know, Mount Pollock is a gem as as many other places. Um, and I do feel like we really do have to protect the space for the public. Um, and I've, you know, seen public being denied access, you know, inadvertently because of there was events there before. So um, I agree that we don't have any official rule, but um, I feel like we might have to take the time and develop it. So, thanks, um, Jason. Yeah, I just want to. I agree that fifty people is a large amount of people for that area. I guess I'm assuming it's up the hill, but um, just as far as creating a rule is concerned. I don't know if we can necessarily go with a blanket rule for all conservation commission land because they are different and they all have different uh, resources associated with them. Parking specifically is what I'm thinking. Uh, so just, we, I would just like to add that we bear that in mind. And then as far as chairs are concerned, chairs, 50 chairs up there, you know, going potentially metal folding chairs, sitting on wet, maybe soft soil, poking holes in the soil. I don't know if that's that's not favorable for me either. Um, I think that can create a bit of damage there. Thanks, Jason. Andre? Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just throw out that uh, just because we haven't um, come up with uh, an actual policy that spells out how much how many people are allowed and or how many people is too much and so on if you just take it uh take it from the point of view that uh you know this is going to be a, a big impact on the area and it's also going to be prohibitive to other users um by so many people being there at once uh i think that's enough uh without a, uh, having to have it spelled out um you know there are i think the uh the uh, bylaws uh, have built in enough um, enough of a tool for us that uh, we can uh, use the bylaws to uh, determine that something is going to negatively impact um, an, an area. So I, you know, as we move toward uh, making these policies or uh, figuring out what uh, what a maximum is and so on, we can rely on uh, these regulations to. Uh, help uh, help protect the area. Thanks, Andre. Alex. Yeah, I'm going to be a little bit of a contrarian. Thanks. Mount Pollux is visited by a lot of people, and um, I'm not sure that over the space of time, 50 people up there is really going to cause any damage. The one thing that comes to my mind is uh, uh, sanitary concerns with 50 people. I don't know if there isn't a porta potty that I'm aware of up there and um to me that would be a concern that you got 50 people for a couple of hours with no facilities um that would be my one objection but in terms of um the other things that are raised the i understand that they want to have it to themselves for a couple of hours it's a lovely place to get married it wouldn't bother me but the facilities having personal facilities available. Um, if there aren't personal facilities, which I don't think they're going to move a party party up there, but I would not favor that crowd without personal facilities. Yep. Uh, good point. Once you get to 50 people for an hour, that um, necessitates like, uh, you know, supporting that number of people. Um, and then I just will add that adding a golf cart to transport things also increases the impact just by the virtue of being able to carry more stuff um, and add stuff and leave stuff and impact stuff. 
Erin, go ahead. Yeah, so I think there's like a, a lot of great points that have been made. I just want to sort of zero in on a couple things. Um, I think the point about the porta potties is an excellent one. I think that they put down for a two hour window. And when it comes to setup and take down of everything, you're probably looking at at least that, if not more. Um, so I think that is a very legitimate point. Um, the other thing is, so and this is just for for context and the applicant was supposed to be here i don't i don't see her um which you know something might have come up and it might be good for us to table to a time when she can come but um the golf cart was the purpose of the golf cart was supposed to be to transport people who were part of her family who were um uh had had um, accessibility issues um so that's that was the purpose of asking for the golf cart. Now, as far as the awning and the chairs and all of that, um, it was noted to me that there would they would need vehicle access to deliver those things. And I think it's completely legitimate for the commission to say, you can't bring a vehicle up to install those materials um, that you'd have to physically use physical labor to deliver them um, because vehicles are only allowed for maintenance, but I do think it might be legitimate to say for um, an accessibility reason for somebody who's unable to walk that using a golf cart would be a, a potential thing that the commission might consider. Um, uh, I, I guess I the, just, okay, sorry. Go the ahead. other thing that occurs to me is like, I don't recall the commission ever putting a limitation on the number of people. So I want to make sure that we're not that there's equity here. Like I don't I don't recall whether previous permits have come through with this number. I I can't remember one this large. Um, I just don't want to sort of make the applicant feel like we're singling anyone out in terms of the number of people. But I do agree that there are some other considerations that, um, you know, it's it it's a it's a kind of a, an unusual um, request. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to try and wrap this up here. I think that um, Mount Pollux isn't for weddings. And if you need accessibility, then there's probably other venues that can um, accommodate that better than Mount Pollux. And the reason that we don't have vehicle access is because it limits the impact ultimately of what gets to the top and how many people get to the top. And that's sort of a built-in limitation of you know, how many people and what the stuff is that's going to be up there. So I am absolutely not in favor of allowing a vehicle. I don't even want to set that precedent. I'm not, 50 people doesn't bother me. It's the chairs and the awning and the vehicles and all of the stuff that goes with it. Like, I don't know who said it, but, you know, putting all the chairs down, putting the awning up, that's trampling, that's impacting the ground, et cetera. So I'm not going to suggest that we say no, but I think we should put some limitations about it. And if, you know, Amherst has other places to do this kind of thing where it is accessible and would, you know, be better suited possibly to a recreation area, but it is a lot of people and it is way more stuff than I've ever seen on the commission. So um, I would suggest that we uh, just make our comment that we wouldn't uh, approve this. And I don't, it seems like this is where we're going under these conditions and that if they scale it back, then we could consider it under, under other circumstances. Food for thought, Bruce, go ahead. Well, I agree with what you just said. And I think that Aaron should convey the sense of the group back to the applicant um, so quickly. So that we're, they're not waiting another two weeks to find out that we're gonna say no. Um, whatever the reason is they're not here, okay, but I think we should give them a pretty strong sense that changes would have to be made to, to make it worthwhile even trying further. Can I just ask a couple pointed questions of the board to kind of gauge where people are at? Um, Michelle, is that okay? Yeah. Just because I need to communicate Jason, with you. Jason, do you want to say one more thing before we... No, go ahead. Aaron. I I was just going to say what if we're going to make comments and relay that information to them, we should be very specific on the comments that we make and tell them exactly what it is that we want to see changed. Yes, yes. let's do that right now. Exactly. So, so who would want a porta potty if this event occurred? No porta potty. I mean, no. Okay. I, I don't you even want to go there. You can't get a porta potty up there without, uh, unless they would put it in the parking lot. Yeah, right. no porta potty. Okay. Like, okay. I also want to be mindful of setting precedent for the rest of the weddings that we're going to hear. And this yes. is, you know, we're okay. moving towards something different. Okay. Okay. Rachel, um, did you want to say something before we 
Yeah, I just I do want to um, be inclusive to people um, with mobility challenges and people of different ages who, you know, if, you know not everybody can stand for a long time. Um, some people think they're they're good and then, um, you know, they lose muscle. This, my father is that way, like he, he loves to hike. Um, he's in his 80s and he's good for like a quarter mile and then he, he'll just drop suddenly. So if there is anyone in that person's family um, who has those issues, having a chair for that individual or the, the cohort of people who are that age range would be more inclusive. So not chairs for 50, but chairs for, for five or okay. six. I think that would be a reasonable consideration. And then I'm just trying to think of another way to get someone who's mobily challenged up there without damaging lawn. And then maybe that's something to ask them if there's another another way um, to get folks up, but um, it it would be nice if if the space could accommodate all users um, without damaging the land. I am aware that in the past there have been um, uh, arrangements made for people with disabilities to get to the top. Um, I I'm not sure it was this specific board that was involved with that, but it was, I know that I, it was mentioned to me by Dave that previously accommodations were made for people with disabilities to get to the top. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, well, this gives me a pretty good starting point. I think I'd like to have a conversation with Dave and a conversation with the applicant and um, relay sort of the concerns. Was there anything else that I that I missed? I've got the issue with porta potties, issue with yeah. I would say that if we're going to have some kind of vehicle, and I would say limited to a golf cart or something like that, that it's solely for the purpose of transporting people with mobility issues and not for equipment and that any equipment has to be carried and that will sort of create its own limit on what ends up there. And then, you know, just be clear that um, nothing can be left. And I would say like, you know, no helium balloons, no rice, no confetti, all of these things that um, maybe aren't obvious, but could create just litter problems. No birds. Um, sorry. No bird seed. Is that a thing at weddings? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then add that to the list. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think that's what I was thinking of, Alex. Yeah, with regard to chairs, rather than putting a number, I would ask Aaron to just limit the chairs, the number of chairs to the number of people that have mobility issues. We don't know how many that is, and that would provide. Uh, access to to folks that have mobility issues. If there's two or 10 or whatever, just limit the chairs to those people with mobility issues rather than a number. But that was a good point. Yeah. And maybe being explicit about that and, and also having the discussion that this is not closing it to the public and the public are still able to access it. And there can't be any sign. I mean, do we allow a sign saying event? That seems sort of exclusive to me. I don't like signage. I think that's in our land use policy. So none of that either. I think that, that we have allowed temporary signage just for people the day of to put up for people to say wedding here or something like that. I'm pretty sure they have done little okay. signs in the past. Um, but one other comment, I guess, and this has been relayed before was for carpooling. So. Um, that they pick another location to park and have a carpool to deliver people to the site. The other thing that sort of, you know, and I know this came up with the um, film filming project was police detail because that access road is really in a bad location as far as cars coming and going. And, you know, if for some reason members of the wedding party build up the parking lot, but then people were still showing up and having to turn around and back out and pull into the road or tried attempting to park on the road. Um, it could get like a public safety issue. So um, yeah. Yeah, I know we talked about that and it like kind of pains me that we'd be putting sort of tax dollars on this private wedding mm -hmm. that they're not even paying a fee for. And uh, like, I, I know it's a safety issue, but if we're gonna get to that, then I would like to talk about like a fee structure for weddings or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Uh, Laura, go ahead. I, I guess my, my point is, um, are we 
with all these conditions, assuming, you know, do we still want to see if the board would approve it rather than, you know, making all these conditions and then seeing where the vote would lay? I guess in my mind, if we agreed to a wedding of a meaningful size every Saturday and Sunday through the summer, just having experienced an event there with a sign and parking and police detail, as a general member of the public, I'm going to think Mount Pollux is closed. And, um, and you know, to be honest with you, the police officer told me Mount Pollux was closed during the filming mm -hmm. and that I had to turn around and people were being denied access. So I, I just, I, you know, I know we can't solve it on this call, but, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. The worst thing would be we, you know, we make these conditions and it still does not pass this board. So on this committee. Thanks, Laura. Andre? Yeah, I was going to mention also the uh, the parking issues. Um, and I'm glad that uh, Aaron covered it. Um, you know, no matter what they bring with them, uh, or porta potty or no power to potty, 50 people at one time for one event, there is 50 people that we are essentially inviting to use that place all at once if we approve, uh, if you, we approve this proposal. I, I'm not comfortable with that. Thanks, Andre. Alex? I just want to say, as chair of the subcommittee that's dealing with the land use policies, I take note. And we'll put it on our agenda to try and draft something. And I'd ask the board for guidance. Do we want it just for Mount Pollux? That would be a place to start, or do you want it broader? Yeah, good things to keep in mind. And I'm hoping everyone's going to retain some of this conversation because it's going to come back to us as another land use application, but also when we review our policies. So um, I think that's why we're, you know, I'd like to be spending this time on it. Erin? Yeah, I know that we're taking a lot of time with this and I want to make sure we move on, but I just wanted to make a couple quick points. The first is that there is a section of the land use policy that already addresses this. We're just, we haven't sort of circled back to getting it before the whole CONCOM. Um, but I do th agree with Alex that maybe we should take another look at that with the, you know, the committee or the c commission as a whole, just to address this in co in the context of this request, since it's kind of an unusual one. But the other thing that I would just ask people to keep in mind, like, and this is, this is uh, kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit, but also just thinking like holistically community wide about members of the community. Um, the first is people who are from Amherst might not all have the same um, socioeconomic background. And there may be people in the community who, for example, want to have a wedding, but cannot afford to have a wedding at a wedding venue. And so that could be part of the draw of Mount Pollux is that some people can't afford to spend thousands of dollars to go to a wedding venue. And this might be something where they want to have their family there. And this is something that they can afford to do. Um, and so I just want to kind of keep that in the back of our mind, because I think there is, um, I, and I, I agree that like there has to be limitations. I just want to make sure that we're not just outright saying no, but potentially trying to work with the applicant to, I mean, in any way we can, I would just encourage that we keep that under consideration. Yeah, and to follow up, um, Dave has commented during these discussions before that there used to be very big weddings there, and it kind of has petered out. Um, okay, lots of hands. Um, Bruce. I don't see a way to manage the 50 people as the limit, and 50 easily can escalate into 70 or more. True, and, and there's nobody I, checking. Yeah, and I but I also agree with Aaron that we should... I'll take back what I said earlier. I think we should try to work with the applicant and see if there's a way to get towards this, but let them know that this this is going to be a tall mountain for them to climb, <laughs> to use the wrong metaphor. Thanks, for, uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, two, well, two or three things, I guess. I know we're somewhat belaboring this, but uh, is smoking? I don't see anything saying that smoking is not allowed on conservation land. Is smoking allowed on conservation land? No. 
I don't that's see in that the any... land use. It, so it's not probably in this, which is a good point, but it is in the land use yeah, rules and regs. People. There's probably that's also a good point. Person. We should probably just add that to this, <laughs> this um, form, Aaron. And then in these questions, it says, you know, is signage proposed as part of this event? They say no. Will vegetation be impacted by proposed event? They say no. Will proposed event cause ground disturbance? They say no. I don't think that's true. 50 people standing on the vegetation is going to cause ground disturbance and it's going to impact vegetation. So just, you know, I, I know we get a number of these and I think people just look and they say no, 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 no. And they don't, they may not even understand what ground disturbance is or what, you know, uh, impacting vegetation means. But just, just as something of a point that I do think 50 people milling around, walking around, standing around is going to, you're going to get a lot of impact to the vegetation and potential ground disturbance all at one time. Ms. Jason, Laura? Andre, I think you're ahead of me. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so, you know, we are talking about uh, accommodations. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, if they don't, if folks don't have an, uh, anywhere to go, what, I mean, they're requesting specifically Mount Pollux. What about the uh, Graf Park? What about the fields, the playing fields, which uh, you can drive right up to and have your ceremony there with your chairs? Um, there are a whole lot of different places that, uh, that can be used that are easily accessible. It's Mount Pollux what they're seeking. So, it, you know, um, just to bring another bit of perspective into our conversation, they, there are, I mean, we're not seeing a land use application for uh, any of the other parks for uh, weddings. It's all in Mount Pollux, which is the kind of the, the most difficult place to, uh, to set something like that up. And it's quite impactful. So I mean, we got to keep that in mind, too you know, the practicality of, of what, what, what are they asking for? They're asking for a gem. I don't, anyway, uh, there are other places that folks can get married at uh, that are beautiful locations and easily accessible and have uh, uh, some bathrooms around and you can set up uh, chairs. So um, we have to keep that. I think it's important to keep that in perspective. I just, I'm just not seeing it uh, the way it's, the yeah. application has been done. Thanks, Andre. I, yeah, I had mentioned that before that if it's accessibility is a problem, mm -hmm. that um, all of those locations that you mentioned, which are rec areas and have more of a system for reservation um, than a land use application and are set up for that amount of people, are an option. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah. So just finally, I just want to comment that I've been on a lot of these um, land use applications for weddings in Mount Pollux, and nothing has ever come close to fifty people. And I feel like we're now in the business of like wedding approval, porta potties, smoking. You know, I I just um, I, I get very concerned when I think about setting the precedent that we're allowing fifty people to go on a public space and all of the not only the damage that incurs, but um, yeah, I just I think you know I'm most definitely not in favor of that. So. Okay, thanks. I'm going to just take a hand roll call here about who is, um, yeah, keep your camera on, who would be in favor of um, continuing the discussion with uh, communicating our limitations um, about this, but not, maybe I'll just do it the easy way. Who is not in favor and knows it and is, doesn't need any more discussion on it? Raise your hand. Wow, okay. Um, all right, that's a majority. So I think we don't need to continue. I saw I saw five hands, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, um, I think we can discontinue this conversation. And Aaron, I, do you, or you feel like you could relay the concerns of the commission and if they wanna come back with a different number and a different, um, proposal that we would consider that, but that 50 is too much, especially with the, the other 
impact criteria. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to not approve land use application for Mount Pollux CLU 24-8. I second. I, I can't make the motion, so I'm asking. Are we, are we not approving or are we denying? Yeah, I don't know. I've never done this before. Let, to deny the, the application CLU 24-8. I'll make so a motion, Michelle. Okay, I think I have Laura on the motion and Andre on the second. Rachel? And I for reject To deny. Okay, and then and nay. Okay, Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Laura. And I for rejecting. Aye. Yeah, sorry. I have to figure out how to do that better. <laughs> Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Okay. I abstain. I I'm I'm based on precedent and previous conversations. I don't know where I fall on this exactly. Um, okay. There is another wedding application. Um, CLU 24-9. This is also for Mount Pollux. This is for July 2nd at 6.30 p.m. to 7. So half an hour, four people, no equipment. Okay, any questions or comments from commissioners here? Andre. Thanks. Um, yeah, totally different uh, story here. Uh, I have no problems with four people going there to get married. Thanks, Andre. Alex. I don't have a problem with that, but I would ask Aaron to condition it that there are um, they leave the places they found it, so there's no confetti, there's no rice, there's no, there's, there's, there's nothing left behind. Yep, and then we do the regular parking situation um, and the disclaimer that it's uh, still open to the public and they have no right to private uh, use of Mount Pollux, and I think that's it. Okay, looking for a motion. Unless there's any objections, looking for a motion to approve CLU 24-9 for the wedding on Mount Pollux on July 2nd. I move to oh. approve the land use application for CLU 24-9 wedding at Mount Pollux, July 2nd, 2024. Second. Jason on the motion, Bruce on the second. Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay, great. We got through all of those. What time is it? Okay. And we're ready for the NOI. So this is open. Okay, here. Yeah, Aaron. Did I miss yeah, something? Yeah, it's just a continuation. They're still... Um they're making some last minute edits that they weren't able to finish um, for tonight, but they're confident they'll be ready for the 26th, so. Okay, so can I skip my hearings announcement then? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we can okay. just move right to a continuation. All right, looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for the Montague Road Battery Storage Project to EP number 0890731 to 626.24 at 7.35 p.m. So moved. Um, second. Okay, I have Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Were there any questions? No? Okay. Rachel? Abstain. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, okay. Minor administrative change. So let's do Fort River first. Okay. Um, Aaron, do you want to give us the update on this, please? Sure. Um, we've got a couple reps here. Um, before we pull them in, I'll just give a quick update and then we can draw people in as needed. But um, at the last meeting, I reviewed with the commission the changes um, that were proposed to the stormwater, the playground um, at Fort River School. The commission, um, because the the scope, footprint, et cetera, hadn't changed at all in terms of the the plan changes. The commission felt comfortable approving the changes as a minor administrative change. 
the couple things that I had on my list um, from the commission as far as um, prior to approval that they wanted to see were one, a letter from the um, school department and the the town in general acknowledging that these changes had been made to the plan and and accepting responsibility for the operation and maintenance associated with the changes to the um, plan from the original approved order of conditions. And then number two, there was a question relative to how, because of not going through a formal amendment process with the order, um, if there was a way to document um, that the plan um, date had been updated for these minor administrative changes. So I did consult our town attorney. Um, they basically noted that um, I should check with the registry of deeds, which I followed up with the registry. And we've come to the conclusion that the commission can issue an affidavit um, based on their approval of the minor administrative change, which can be recorded on the on the deed, um, referencing that the only that basically that the um, the the only change to the order was the updated plan dates, and that the commission found that the changes were minor um, and administrative in um, uh, in their how they were proposed. So I think that the commission is on solid ground to approve the changes um, based on the information that I've collected, but the applicants uh, are here to, if, if the commission has more changes or wants to review the edits further. Thanks, Erin. Okay. Um, are there any commissioner questions or comments on this that we need to ask of the applicants? Um, I have a question, sorry. My video is stalling out. Can you guys hear me? You're good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so Aaron, I, when I was reading the correspondence, it looked like there was sort of two issues. The first one you addressed just now, is there a second issue that we wanted to discuss tonight as well about um, recording something that goes on the title? Was that, a, was that a matter? I thought I read that in the email correspondence. Yeah, so the two issues were the school department and the town signing off on the, the the updated operation and maintenance plan that was one and then the second was documenting um through recording at the registry that the minor administrative change had been approved okay. Okay. so that that was the item that i just referenced that yeah. it sounds like town attorney and the registry would be okay with a signed affidavit that documents that the dates mm -hmm. of the plans have been updated great thank you any other yeah. questions? Yeah. Um, Aaron, so would that affidavit, would that also record the plan themselves with the affidavit for visual reference, or is it just a document, like a crumb that you need to look at this other plan? Exactly. So it okay. would reference the book and page of the order of conditions, and then just note that these, these noted um, plans, which are associated with the order, that the revision date had been updated. Anyone else? Okay. Um, all right. I don't think we need to bring anybody in for this. So if there's any versions ready and looking for um, approval for the minor order administrative, uh, the minor administrative change, the orders of condition for Fort River School DEP number 0890729. Uh, I guess, given the conditions that Aaron's outlined, including the affidavit. Um, I move that, what you just said. <laughs> um, I second that. Okay. Uh, Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, um, lot six, DEP number 0890663. Do you wanna give us a summary of this one? And I'll note that it's in two places tonight, yes. Yes, um, okay, so, and the applicant was also supposed to be here tonight, but didn't make it. Um, so let me um, <clears throat> give you a little breakdown. So back in 2021, there had been a 
lengthy, very lengthy, probably the most lengthy um, review process of any orders of conditions since I've been working for the town um, related to these lots. There was actually originally six lots um, and two of the lots, the commission basically asked the applicant to withdraw, which they did. Um, this one lot, which is lot six, um, the applicant is requesting to move the house footprint. Um, there is a plan in your OneDrive folder that shows the existing house footprint and the proposed house footprint. And I can pull those up if folks would like to see them. Yeah, um, I think that would be useful. Okay, let me, let me do that. Um, so in speaking with the applicant who's not here tonight, um, they, um, so, okay, let me just, this is the, this is the approved house footprint right here. And um, there's a couple issues to sort of be aware of, and this is a good sort of historical context for members of the board who were not on the board at the time this was approved. This is a very complicated one, and we'll, we'll get into why later in the meeting, but this was a subdivision that was approved 20 years ago, basically, exactly 20 years ago. Um, there, you'll see that there's a BVW line. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but there's a BVW line. Um, originally, the BVW line was approved as part of the order of conditions, but after the permit was issued and the subdivision was built, a vernal pool was documented within the BVW. And so you'll see this potential vernal pool line that cuts through here. Um, so the house was permitted. Um, you see that there is a no disturb um, uh, line here, which is following the 25 foot no disturb. So this was approved under our previous bylaw prior to the one that was updated on June 22nd, 2022. Um, and you can see that there is grading um, up to the 50 foot buffer and this this is the proposed house footprint. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second and go to the request for the change. So this is the requested change in the house footprint. Um, now this is a very rough drawing. Um, I did mention to the applicant that, um, you know, previously the house footprint had been outside of the 100 foot buffer with the exception of the proposed patio and that this shifts the structure slightly into the 100 foot buffer. Um, one comment from the applicant was that due to the existing topography on the site that moving the house to this location would actually reduce the amount of grading that was necessary for construction, which may actually reduce the grading footprint of the yard. Um, regardless of that, um, one comment talking offline with a commissioner was that they should update the plan to show the grading line changes. Um, so that's something that the commission could potentially ask for. But really the commission, the, the applicant is asking for a minor administrative change to the order of conditions to shift this house footprint to this location on the plan. So that is the ask tonight relative to lot six. Okay, and can you just remind us, uh, you know, offhand what constitutes a minor administrative change, if you can say that in two sentences for everybody? Right. So it's a it's a little bit of a discretionary decision on the part of the commission. Um, as far as DEP is concerned, I've inquired with them quite a bit on these. Um, we're looking at impacts. Are the impacts changing? So are they proposing to alter more resource area um, as part of the project than was originally proposed? I like to think of it as footprint and scope. So is the footprint of the project changing or expanding? Is the scope of the project changing or expanding? That's, that's typically how I like to do it. Ultimately, the question being asked of you is, will you consider approving this as a minor administrative change or in reviewing this, would you prefer that the applicant come back to you and amend the order of conditions formally by notification of a butters and posting of a legal ad um, in order to approve the change? Thanks, Erin. And with the amendment, that latter one that you just uh, noted, 
they would still be within the older bylaws and they would not, I mean, their permit would still be within that and not be subject to the uh, revisions. That's a really good question, Michelle. And um, I, I would presume since it was already approved um, that it would fall under the old bylaw, but I might need to get some clarification to be solid on that answer. Okay, thanks. Okay, I see hands. Um, I'm just gonna go clockwise. I didn't catch you went first, uh, Laura. I think I'm. I think I'm last, Michelle. Okay, Jason. Nice. <laughs> um, I'm. I'm trying to. I. I'm a little. I need a little bit of clarification. They said that there would be little impact, but it appears that the proposed building footprint has. A larger portion within the hundred foot buffer than the existing, and so this is an existing home. That's so. This is an empty. This is a lot that's not graded, and so how was it? If there was a if there was a potential vernal pool, how how is it that this lot then is able to exist or this project? Well, I'm going to say this project being this house under an existing order of conditions. Do they not need an NOI? So this is a notice of intent. This is an order of conditions. They came in and applied for a notice of intent. They're outside of the hundred foot buffer for the vernal pool. Um, for this lot, they're outside of the hundred foot buffer for the vernal pool. The work is only partially within the hundred foot buffer of the bordering vegetated wetland. Um. The comment that was made relative to the grading was that because of the existing topography of the land, shifting the house would reduce the amount of grading necessary. But that's commentary, and I don't, I'm not an engineer. I haven't seen any grading plan. Um, so that's just mm -hmm. being relayed from what the applicant told me. Yeah, we're just being presented with what appear to be proposed topo, proposed contours, not existing. Um, but right. so, but I'm still confused a little bit in that we're saying this is a minor administrative change to an NOI. What is, is the NOI the 20 year old? No, the, the order of conditions was issued in 2021. Um, it was a, a very lengthy permit process for this particular, uh -huh. um, applicant. The permit was filed, I believe, in 2019, and it took two years for us to issue an order of conditions relative to there was there was six original lots, um, individual orders of um, notices of intent and orders of conditions for each lot. Two of those were withdrawn um, because the impacts were. The commission was. Um, there was there were. The, I think in the in the view of the commission, even under the old bylaw, those lots were not buildable. So they asked the applicant to withdraw those. Um, Doesn't don't these expire though at some point? Yeah, that that's why the so the next in uh, under our agenda there the next um, items are for extensions to the four orders of conditions that were granted in this, including subject. this one. Well, the, the no, yeah. So the four individual lots. This one is in that um, request for extension. What, which, uh, what do we have to extend the order of conditions first before we amend it? Well, it's not expired yet. Okay. They're, they they okay. they have to request the extension before the permit expires. So they're right. trying to sort of excuse the expression, but kill two birds with one stone coming to us to say, we have a change on this lot and we'd like to uh, extend the expiration date on the remaining four lots. There's okay. another piece to it, which we'll get to next, but I think we should just handle these one piece at a time. And what, so when does it, ex when does it expire? Do you know off the top of your head? I don't see that. I didn't see that anywhere in the packet. Um, one of these September 2024, if it was issued in September. Yes, I, I believe it's 2024, but I thought it was August. Let me just oh. verify. Hold on just one sec. Sorry, 
it's hard to do this on a shared screen. Uh, yeah, so yeah. August 8th, 2024 is the expiration date. Say it again. Uh, uh, August 8th, 2024 is the expiration date for the four orders of conditions. Okay. Um, should I move on, Jason? Yeah. Uh, Rachel? I had, oh, I had mostly questions about um, when this expired, but I, it does look like the building footprint design has changed. Um, and I also am just curious, does, does the, does the, are they on well and septic here? Or are they all municipal water and sewer? Are there any utilities that are not on this plan that we need to worry about? I believe they're on water and sewer to the best okay. of my knowledge. Okay. Laura, my question is around um, the grid, you know, and so I was here in the original discussions. At what point I think this is going to require like legal to opine, but when we grant something years ago with the changing ecosystem, um, climate change being real. I think, you know, I, I am very curious legally, does it fall under our old, I know this was brought up, but does it fall under the older bylaws or the current one? And are we permitted to ask for, you know, further delineation of wetlands given the fact that you know, the climate's changing across our community. Um, I'm just not sure of what our rights are here. Um, so I'd be very curious to know uh, answers to those questions. Um, so, thanks. That's all right, Alex. Yeah, I'm with Laura on that. And I just want a clarification. Aaron, did I hear you say that if we asked them to come back, um, that they would then fall under the new regulations i i am not entirely certain how that would play out um since they already have an order of conditions um if they came back for an amended order of conditions i would assume they'd fall under the new regulations but i am i'm not solid on that it's something i would want to check with our town attorney to get a definitive answer on yeah so i'll just i'll just say that i'm generally uncomfortable with um, um, limited changes, uh, administrative changes. And I I would feel more comfortable if they provided new information. Thanks, Alex. Bruce? I think we need legal clarity before we do anything with this one. And then for the extensions, I'll go back to what Laura said. We're gonna give a two year extension to something that is now where the context is moving. I, I'd like more information. Yeah, well, let's get to that. And then okay. first ahead, decide, just, no, yeah. I know, I, I, they're connected, right? Um, yeah. So what's in front of us is this minor administrative change. Um, I don't know who said it, but I think that, you know, we weren't provided any information to show that there were going to be less or the same impacts. And so at the best, we can't make a decision. And at the most, it, to me, it looks like the building footprint changed. There's more in the buffer and that based on that blueprint, there is more impact. So unless they can support their... Um, claim that there's going to be less impacts of some kind of grading plan, then I'm not in favor of granting this um, minor administrative change. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, if they're already moving the, it, it, it looks to me like they're moving it completely horizontally on the page. Are they, do they have a required setback? Can they just move it forward a little bit so it's not even in the 100 foot buffer? We're already moving the house to footprint once. Um, you mean move it closer to the road? Yeah, like yeah, is there a required I, forty foot setback, twenty five foot, whatever? Yeah, I think, and I'm I'm operating off memory here, but I believe there's a twenty five foot um 
S setback. Yeah, there is a 25 foot setback, but I'm just looking They're to see. Well within that 25 foot. Yeah, if they could still shift they it. They could forward. still move it up. Uh huh. And then it would be, and then it looks like potentially it would be out of the 100 foot buffer, at which point then we would not have any jurisdictional authority over it. Well, there would still be grading. Um, I don't think that they could shift oh. it even you know, 10 feet, they'd still have to be grading around the site for during construction. But your point is taken that the structure would then be out of the 100 foot buffer. So it would just be grading. So I think that's a, that's a um, good suggestion. Thanks, Jason. Bruce? Um, just as a general construct, I'm pretty uncomfortable with, in effect, Aaron having to represent the applicant because the applicant's not here to answer these questions. We're sort of relying on her to answer them and it's not fair to her. That is a good point, Bruce. I think we should just get back to the applicant and ask the applicant attend the next meeting with more information, um, what Jason said, and also with a grading plan and um, provide some defensibility to their claim why this should be a um, minor administrative change. So do we need, is, anyone, is everyone okay with that? Does any more discussion provide to Aaron? No. Jason? No, no, I was just going to ask are we are we denying it or are we yeah i was gonna ask that too. wanting more do we need to move on can we continue this yeah um, you don't have okay. to take any action um I right think you've, you've requested I... some adjustments to take into consideration the request um and i can relay that to the applicant and he, they can come back to have the commission reconsider once they have you guys have more information in front of you Okay, great. Thank you for bringing that up, Bruce. Okay, so let's um, take no action on that and let's move on to the lot in question, among others. And now we're moving into the conversation we already started about changing conditions. And so this is a request for extension on the order of conditions. Um, yeah, so this is old now and things have changed. <laughs> so this is, okay, do you want to just give a summary for this one? I'm not sure that we specifically addressed it. Which, which one are we on now, please? Sorry, we're on the request for extension of order conditions for lot five, six, seven, and eight, and also the Amherst Hills. And they all sort of warrant um, maybe some discussion individually, but I'll go over. Yeah, so... Um, I'll, I'm going to do my best to sort of sum up, and I think we should talk about the four lots first and then move on to the larger discussion about Amherst Hills subdivision. So um, two of the lots had greater impact on the out of the four. Um, two of the lots had encroachment into the 100 foot no disturb associated with the vernal pool. There was this is why the orders of conditions were took two years for us to issue. Um, there was there are if you look at the orders of conditions, they're very, very strict um, because there are requirements for um, biologists to be on site during construction, during big night, if it's under construction to have biologists there doing sweeps. Um, there's there's all kinds of conditions associated with two of these lots. At the time that this was, these lots were approved, it was, it was a very tr um, difficult, um, they were difficult projects to review for a variety of reasons. And, I, and I'll give you the context in terms of the overall subdivision so that you guys can have a big picture view of it because I think that might be helpful here. So the Amherst Hills subdivision was a multi-phase subdivision with multiple roads and they were constructed sort of in a phased approach. Two of the phases were completed. And when I say the phases were completed, I'm talking about the construction of the roadway, the construction of the stormwater structures that were part of the original order of conditions. And that's the one that's later in this meeting. So two of those were constructed. Now, as part of that order of conditions, individual notices of intent were required for specific lots within the order. Um, and the reason for that was because at the time that the subdivision plan came in, there weren't individual house plans. They were sort of 
um, selling the houses um, on spec, if that makes sense. So they were selling the lots and people were essentially designing what they wanted to have built on the individual lot. And so the commission required that they file an individual notice of intent for each house that was built. The subdivision was approved. The order of conditions was issued in the early 2000s. And these four lots, actually the total of six lots were part of the subdivision. So when the subdivision was constructed, there was a number of stream crossings that were also installed and in associated stormwater infrastructure. And when those stream crossings were installed, because this was the early 2000s, we had no stream crossing standards and there was a number of culverts that were installed and it changed sort of the hydrology of the overall site. And as a result of that, a vernal pool um, essentially formed. And, it, and the vernal pool may have been there before, but just never have been documented. Um, the vernal pool species may have been there and never documented. But in any case, at the time that these six lots were filed, the vernal pool had been discovered and species associated with it had been discovered. It was a known vernal pool at that point. So the commission was in a position where they had approved the subdivision, they had approved the lots associated with the subdivision and required individual notice of intent to be filed for each of the lots. And now there was this vernal pool that basically made some of the lots unbuildable. And from a legal standpoint, that's a really tricky place for the commission to be because um, it can be seen as sort of a taking, right? A taking of land when something's already been permitted. And it had already been approved by Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program as part of the original order of conditions because portions of the land weren't mapped as NHESP estimated habitat at the time the original order of conditions was issued. So fast forward to the time the, the six notices of intent came in, we have a lot more information at this point. We know there's a vernal pool. We know the wetland boundaries have changed. A lot has changed on the site 20 years after the original order of conditions was issued. So um, that's why these orders were, were approved very, very rigidly. Um, two of them in particular, I believe seven and eight, are very strict because portions of the grading and portions of the structures, I believe, are located within the 100 foot no disturb to the vernal pool. The other two lots, I believe five and six, were they were able to move those further out to the edge of the buffer zone and outside of the vernal pool 100 foot setback. Hopefully that's clear to everyone, but I'm happy to field questions on it. Alex. Uh, Aaron, if we were to deny the extension of time, where does that put us? Um, it would mean that the applicant would probably come back to us again um, with new notices of intent. I, having reviewed those projects and issued gone through an extensive peer peer review process um, and um, uh, an extensive sort of review of everything. Um, I think it, it would be very challenging since the commission has already approved um, the houses on the lots. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think it would it, it could potentially um, get sticky, legally speaking, um, into the future. Can I, can I follow up, Chair? Yes, go ahead. It seems to me that the developer has had plenty of time to do something and um, is now being advised to come in for an extension for whatever reason. And um, they're not here to me that um, uh, would have been advisable on their part to be here to represent themselves. Um, and my gut feeling is that they've had plenty of time to act on what was approved and they haven't done it. And um, on the face of it, I'm uncomfortable giving them an extension of time. Jason. Is there any 
it in the all we have is a a very very brief letter that says we are respectfully requesting an extension of two years. Do we require a reason why they're re requesting this extension? Uh, like I I agree with Alex. I mean they're not here they're not here to talk and you know based on Bruce's comments for the last uh, the last issue was. Aaron, we're relying on you to make the case for the these applicants um, without any information from them as to why they are looking for the extension. Yeah. And if we've already approved the building of a house, and and I, I don't know, maybe I'm I'm just not following everything every detail. Uh, we approved the building of the house four years ago, or. 20 years ago right so um <laughs> let me let, yeah i know this is it's it's confusing and i'm doing my best to explain and it when, to you sorry and when i say we i just mean the commission in general because yes certainly most of us weren't i don't think most of us were on the board yeah even four years ago let alone 20 right so and this is also you know it it is a little um it is a little awkward for me but i also um, want to be helpful in providing information to to you all. Um, so let me just. This might help to put things. Uh, if I, I don't can just open something up and show you guys something really quick. Just to, just to follow up with Aaron, do we have an obligation? Do we have a choice? Do we have an obligation to extend to grant an extension? Um, no, we don't. Right. I mean, this is like this the request. Aaron, was there a short answer to that uh Jason's question about four years or 20 years ago? Yeah. Or is so that what you're trying I'm, to okay. I'm gonna I'm I'm pulling up a figure so that I can try to help to help you guys understand all of this. Okay, so this is the original Amherst Hills subdivision. This plan for the roadway stormwater infrastructure associated stream crossings etc. was approved in the early 2000s. Bear with me for just a moment. Hopefully I'm getting this right. Um, and I'm, this is, this is approximate. I'm zoomed out really far because I want to give you guys an overall site context. So this is approximate, but I believe these were the two lots that were withdrawn in the last round of the 2019 filings. I think this one this one, this one, and this one are the four that were approved in 2021. Okay. This subdivision road had already been, is already in place. There's homes um, across the street, all down this road. Over here, there's houses, um, and there's houses all down, all down this, this road in these locations, in many of these locations. Okay, so it was a 20 early, this overall subdivision plan was approved in the early 2000s, but these these four lots were approved in 2021 in conjunction with this um, subdivision plan, which again, approved in, in the early 2000s, but continued for 20 years. Now, the two of the phases of this project were completed, but... The final phase of this project, which is back here, was never completed. So the reason that the applicant wants the extension to the overall subdivision plan is to complete this subdivision. This, this is the 20, 20, um, the early, the permit from the early 2000s. They want to keep continuing this. Now, the last time that the commission considered the extension on this they said they didn't grant a full three-year extension they granted a partial so it was i want to say they gave them a year and a half or so on the permit and they said they wanted to see progress on the construction of these or the you know individual filings or something associated with this or the construction of the roadway or something prior to issuing it to my knowledge they have been in touch with the town um, they've done inspections on the existing stormwater infrastructure back there um, to 
they're, they've been working, making efforts to try to get the road accepted as a public roadway um, and, you know, having DPW inspect the infrastructure um, that has already been installed in an effort to get the roads that have already been constructed accepted by the town. Um, so I don't know if that gives any clarity to this for anyone or if it just adds more questions, but. Rachel. I'm just wanting to confirm, is there any open construction right now taking place on site? So if we if we don't continue, if we don't grant the extension, would there be an unfinished open site at this point? No, none of okay. the lots, none of those four lots construction has not begun. There is construction, I believe, going on in the subdivision, but some of the lots were outside of Hong Kong jurisdiction. So um, I'm not sh I know like a couple building permits were issued, but they were over the work was over 100 feet from wetlands. Okay. Andre. So what I'm gathering here and I'm looking for anybody to correct me if I'm wrong is that we had uh, we had a bunch of uh, we had a subdivision that was uh, approved uh, in 2000 and then in 2021 they decided that uh, to, they ended up applying for and uh, uh, getting permission to uh, set up the to, to build on these last uh, four lots am, am I right up to there Aaron six lots um, <clears throat> six two, lots two were withdrawn. Yep. Right. Okay. Okay. And four, uh, four were approved with uh, orders of conditions. And here we are, uh, three years later. Right. And um, it there, and they they actually did. Uh, am I right that they applied for an extension already? For one and a half, they applied for three years and got a one and a half year extension. On the overall subdivision. On the oh, over right, okay. So that's for the two thousand um, subdivision permit, and that is to construct the final phase of the subdivision, which are additional lots. There are additional lots. I want to say there's like six or seven lots in that final phase of the subdivision that there have been no permits filed for yet. Okay, and so these uh, all these the five, six, seven, and eight um, were approved uh, under the uh, conditions uh, given as well as under the um, previous bylaws, right? And so now yes. what they're wanting is another shot at the old bylaws by extension of what they, of, uh, of these uh, uh, by extension, by having us extension, extend the order of conditions on five, six, seven, and eight, right? right. Correct. They would um, still be under the old bylaw. Right. Uh, I would like some legal advice uh, on that, uh, but with what I have right now, I'm, I just, I'm, you know, they're asking for, they're asking for uh, essentially a renewal of, in, an, in essence, or an extension which to me is a kind of like a renewal, but they want to use the old, uh, uh, you know, I, the old um, right. uh, bylaws. Uh, I don't know. I'm not. I, I'm not seeing it right now. But I would really. Uh, uh, I think we all uh, could use some uh, uh, some legal advice on that. Thanks, Andre. Um, Bruce. Jason was first. Jason. Thanks, Bruce. I have uh, so there's two issues. It's the four lots and it's the overall, right? Correct. On the extensions, yes. And so Andre mentioned the, the four lots. It's the same thing essentially with the overall, correct? I mean, the four lots, at least something happened four years ago and they had an extension for a year and a half on the overall to start taking action. And it seems like there was not much action taken, but maybe some, uh, which is, you know, um, 
and that that last extension was in 2021 for the um, overall uh i don't remember the exact date of the last extension but there is one other piece of information that you may or may not want to consider um which i know and um Again, I feel very awkward speaking on behalf of the applicant, but it's a piece of information I know to be true, which I think is, is relevant here, which is the builder who was building the spec houses in this subdivision, the gentleman who owned the building company passed away um, since these homes were permitted, I believe. No, oh, that's not true, Aaron. That was a... It was Ron Berkey who passed away. This is Tofino. It's different. Right. So Ron Berkey had been applying for building permits in the subdivision um, to construct the individual houses. I just know because his daughter has been in touch, you know, with me and had, ex you know, expressed that that had been kind of a... Um, disruption in their sort of construction of the homes but I relative to the owner of the property in terms of Tofino I um, that that's just what I know about relative to the building permits for the individual homes all right so you mentioned that there's a third phase that didn't get built and that's up in the kind of north northern corner of it right. and on the plans there are you know, I'm going to say there's there's wetlands that appear to be delineated on the plans. There's a proposed detention basin number one. The uh, basin's already constructed, as are the stormwater structures are all installed. It's very bizarre. Um, the road is a dirt road that was never mm -hmm. paved or built to, you know, town specifications. I, I don't know, like, uh, just off the top of my head, if there was like sidewalks and stuff like that, that were also supposed to be constructed, or if it was just the roadway. Has um, anyone gone out to confirm that the stormwater, that the detention basin is still functioning? Yes. Yep. Um, I've been out to it. And also the DPW has been out to it. All right. Yep. And, and then it, you know, those wetlands are behind a number of those lots and kind of around, or there's a portion of wetlands behind those lots and then around where the proposed detention basin was. Uh, and these were all delineated 20 years ago? Yes. Okay. I would think that, you know, I, I, I would, I feel like there's potential for that wetland delineation to have potentially changed in the last 20 years, given the uh, change in climate and the amount of rainfall that has occurred uh, some years more so than others. Um, and if there was grading that occurred back there, if there's now a detention basin in there that was not there when the wetlands were originally delineated. Um, so I, I'm, I'm having a little bit of issue with extending something that was originally approved 20 years ago for you know a, a phase of a subdivision that doesn't seem like there's been a whole lot of movement on in those last 20 years mr Sam bruce did you want to i'm just going to reiterate what i said on the previous one where yeah. parents have been in the position of representing them and they're not here to represent themselves I do think it's valuable to sort of get the story straight with Aaron without, you know, even if we don't have um, the representative. All right. Well, but I would encourage us to limit. Yeah, I, I would like to move towards something. Um, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I think um, so. Um, if I recall, Aaron, there was maybe it was just on the two sites that were dropped. There was resurveying of the wetland areas, at least on some of the sites within the past, I don't even know, time is lapsing for me, COVID, I have no idea, two years, three years, I have no idea. Yep. Um, was that done for all of the sites no. or just, okay. Just the house lots that were approved, those four house lots that were approved. 
and a question, I know we keep bringing up the legal piece, but um, another question for legal is, can we request um, another refresh of that delineation? You know, I, I think we're all just kind of wondering what our what the legal rights are here. Um, I thought that, and it'd be good to get confirm this, that um, Berkium, like, that they're not in control of those lots right now. It's Tofino, which is a separate company. Um, well, and the only reason why I bring that up is because obviously there would be, a, you know, uh, an excuse if the principal of a company passed away for letting permits lag. But I am um, I don't believe that's the case here. And it certainly feels to me that someone woke up and realized that permits were about to expire. And can we get in to extend them, um, you know, kind of under the radar? And I guess my other question to you is, do we have any other projects uh, at all, and, and certainly those that are sizable, that we're still discussing under the original bylaws? Um, well, yeah, so the bylaw was updated June 22nd 2022 so yes there are still valid permits um that were issued prior to the bylaw passing um that are still valid today and will be valid probably for another t one and a half to two years or so okay um i guess my other follow-up question more broadly not related to this is can we can we put in place just i think the world has changed right climate is quickly changing uh and, and quite frankly, maybe they, they would redo the wetland delineation and it would be to their advantage. I have no idea. Um, but, you know, can we put in place, um, you know, I don't know, a time limit, <laughs> just like everything else. So we don't have to, it's like refreshing memories and, you know, conversations, which um, is just confusing. At yeah. what point can we, at what point can we say, Hey, you know what? You have to start fresh. You know, new world, new bylaws, everything. You guys got to start fresh. Well, I can I can answer that, which is on extensions. The commission has a lot of discretion. There's no appeal process on extensions. So um, if the commission chooses not to issue an extension, that's within your discretion. I do, um, you know, think that there is value um, in looking at the site to see if you know, wetland boundaries have changed. One thing that's unique about this site or this project, which is, you know, it's kind of a testament to <laughs> the history, right? So permitting has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. Um, and when I first started fresh out of college doing this job, there was a lot of um, push from a regulatory standpoint, to permanently bound wetlands. So going in and like, for example, where flagging, wetland flagging was located, putting in permanent rebar wetland markers. And the reason for that was basically to inform the landowners who were buying into this subdivision where that permanent wetland boundary was, similar to what we do with no disturb zones around mitigation areas and buffer zones to prevent and restrict access or people going in there and not knowing, oh, I can't put a shed in the middle of the wetland, right? But one of the things that like with the evolving science and re evolving regulations are, we know wetlands change, right? And so permanently bounding wetlands is a really interesting um, way to sort of document where the wetland boundary has changed <laughs> because you can you can bound it, but then you can go out and look at it and say, okay, the bound is here, but you can see wetland vegetation that's beyond that that bound or something like that. So just an interesting sort of side note as far as that, because that was a requirement on this project that the entire wetland boundary be marked with permanent rebar wetland markers. <laughs> So they're all still out there in most most cases. I mean, some landowners have taken them out or they've been removed, but a lot of them are still there. Hmm. Um, Alex. Yeah, we have a we have a request in front of us which we need to act on one way or the other. And if I might, I'd like to put a motion forward uh, to, if for no other reason to see where we're at at this. 
Um, can I just ask a question before you do that, Alex? I and and then I, I wanted <laughs> to just say that I think the commission has been generous. It has uh, granted an extension, which wasn't acted on. They're not here to represent themselves. And um, they're asking for a two-year extension under previous regulations. So um, that's, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, let me just ask. Um, so Aaron, when you and I talked offline, you mentioned that there is actually now an HESP mapping in this area too that wasn't present before. So that's another consideration for a non-renewal or extension. Um, and is that, okay, so I see the four lots, lots five, six, seven, eight, and then the Amherst Hills, is that the overall subdivision extension that we're talking about or what? Can you remind me how that's different? So it's the last one on the list. It's got its own DEP number. It just says Amherst Hills. Um, okay, so let me go one at a time. So the first thing was a question about NAGSP. I don't know that that's gonna change anything because if they came back with an order of conditions exactly like the current one, they're still grandfathered under NHESP. Their, their permit process, although in tandem with us, is separate from us. And there has been quite a bit of communication with them in regard to whether it would trigger a filing with them or not. They have been pretty steadfast that it would not because it was issued under the previous um, atlas, so to speak, of, of um, heritage. But Again, you know, that's just based on what I know. Now, as far as the question on the subdivision as a whole versus the individual lots, um, let me just pull the plan back up. Yeah, I'm just wondering how to construct a motion around this if we if we well, decide. Well, we have to, to handle each each lot individually. Okay. Um, but I, um, sorry, this is well, takes a long. Can't time. we have a motion that deals with all the individual lots? but not the overall subdivision. I mean, they all have their own order of conditions. They, they Yeah, they all, each of them has an individual um, filing fee associated with it for the extension. Um, right, but we have one request that groups them all together. Hmm. So the individual lots um, are generally in these locations, um, I believe, one, two, three, four, like kind of in, in the line here. Um, I think it's five, six, seven, eight, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, that is associated with those four um, orders of conditions. And then the, this is approximate, um, but this, I believe, is the section of the subdivision that remains uncompleted um, under the overall 20, circa 2000 order of conditions. And is there a nearby wetland delineated there that is casting a buffer? I'm sorry, into that, the Amherst Hills, the the undeveloped subdivision part that oh yes yes yeah, there, okay. there are wetlands over there and those those wetlands um would require into i mean those house lots excuse me would require individual orders of conditions to um to develop um sorry it's really hard for me to navigate on this thing um if i can get over here, but you can see in shaded um, are the wetland boundaries. And I'm just gonna try to go up. Um, ah, it's very difficult to navigate, sorry. Aaron, while you're looking at that as something of a just general question, at any point in time, can a proposed attention basin that may have not been maintained and grows in be considered a wetland? You guys are, you guys are um, really testing me tonight. So the, I mean, testing my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Your patience? <laughs> well, not my patience, my knowledge. <laughs> um, so 
I'm going to have to check on the date of this. I believe it's 1996 that permits that are issued. And again, I want to, I'm operating a lot off memory. I believe that permits for orders of conditions issued after 90, 1996 that were documented as um, stormwater structures are exempt. I mean, they even if they grow in with wetlands, they cannot be considered to be wetland resource areas. But I've got to check that date because I'm not, um, it's been a long time since I've looked at that section of the regs. Um, and it might be that I have the the years wrong. So I want to just verify that. But but you make a great point, Jason, which is that on some um, uh, permits, if a stormwater basin has not been adequately maintained, it um, can be considered resource area. Um, but so I, I need to get back to you with the answer on that to be solid um, that mm -hmm. it can know but what i do know is that the applicant um has had this inspected by the dpw and dpw gave them a list of requirements to bring it into compliance with um town requirements so that this the basin could be accepted um, i also know from walking this access road that there are catch basins all along here that had been previously installed um which, you know, as you might know from installing stormwater infrastructure is very bizarre because usually when you install stormwater infrastructure, you can't bring it online until the site is completed, like all of the site work is completed, but they just installed them. And then I don't know functionally, but uh, how effective they are, et cetera. Um, I assume that DPW has inspected them though, and that they're, they're functional. Uh, otherwise, I don't think DPW would accept them, but yeah, okay, so that's another to-do question. Yeah, lots of assumptions. Um, I'm trying to try and take stock of some of the legal questions we had. One is what Jason just mentioned. One is um, whether or not we can require a new delineation. I'm confused about whether or not if we did that, it would then still fall under the old regulations, which is kind of odd. Um, and I see your hand up, Alex, and maybe you could find a way out of this one for us. <laughs> Alex, do you want to comment? Jason. Jason still got his hand up. Yeah, well, uh, you know, my my concern was just going to continue along the lines of that road that was paved and has the catch basins and discharges into that detention basin was not was never paved. So you have potentially a bunch of sediment from an unpaved road going into catch basins, going into the detention basin raising the bottom elevation of that detention basin, potentially allowing all kinds of things to grow in there. Potentially, you know, I don't, is the curbing up there? It does, I'm just looking at Google Maps right now and it doesn't appear that there's much curbing. There's no, along. there's no paving. Uh, the paving was never installed. So it's there's no curbs, road. right? So right. Like, we don't know what kind of drainage, natural drainage has occurred on that dirt road, right? And and so we've got this this issue back there where the conditions can be completely different now than they were 20 years ago when this thing was designed to permit it. Um, and then as far as like actions tonight, right? Like it's my, we don't have to take action, right? We can either deny it, we can approve it, or we can just take no action. Yes, and, and I'm going to suggest we back. table this, but um, I would like to... I, I'm not sure we have a clear way forward on if we do table it, what is the information we need to then make a decision at the next meeting? So, um, okay, I'm seeing hands, Alex. Yeah, and maybe we could have a show of hands, but I would like to, and this is an emotion, but it is a description of emotion that I was thinking of, and that is to deny the extension for lot five, six, seven, eight, and Amherst Hills as uh and invite the applicant to come back and refile under the current regulations. Okay. Any thoughts, commissioners? Okay. Um, Andre, I have thoughts. Sorry. 
I have some thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, if I were to, I would look at this as, as kind of two different issues going on. One of them is like lots five, six, seven, and eight, and the other uh, Amherst Hills in general. <clears throat> and, um, I, you know, uh, I think we, like, like I said before, we need some more information on the, uh, on the lots, uh, five, five, six, seven, and eight. And I think that uh, the general Amherst Hills uh, one, which has been going on since uh, to, uh, the year 2000, I think they, uh, I, you know, I could tell you right offhand from what I've, uh, what I'm seeing right now, I would, uh, I, I would like them to refile for that. Um, essentially, what the I'm other, yeah. Uh, so, so yes, agreeing, agreeing with Alex on that on the uh, five, six, and eight. Five, six, seven, and eight. Um, I, I, I think we need some more information. Okay, Bruce. Well, I'm in, in favor of what Alex. The, the set. I'm following the sentiment of Alex, um, but I'm uncomfortable doing more than tabling until we have legal opinion on what happens if we go these different directions. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm ready tonight to deny their extension for Amherst Hills um, on account of everything we've just discussed. And since that's like a 20 year old um, delineation, the others are way more recent and I would definitely need more information and would be in favor of tabling it. But um, that's, that's where I stand. Getting at least something off the table. Well, if we if we bundled them together, they would come back with more information. And then we make a decision on what's before us, giving them the option to come back. Sure, I don't think I need them to come back with more information for Amherst Hills personally, but I can't make a motion. So um, I, maybe we'll do a show of hands, like who wants to table the whole thing right now? Okay, nobody one person um, and get more information. Who would like to make a motion to on the Amherst Hills and treat the other four lots differently? A couple of people, three people um, and and me. And then what's, and then we just deny, who is in favor of denying all of them right now? Nobody, one person. Okay, we don't really have a strong majority either way. Aaron, help me out here. Um, I just want to make sure, because I'm not sure of the legality of Laura voting. Um, I just want to make sure that we're careful about that because yeah. um, I don't know relative to where Laura is in terms of abutting and so forth. Yeah. So none of the lots that we're talking about right now, I'm a, I'm in a butter too. Just the one that was dropped. Oh. And I have, to, I think I need to abstain because of my firm's involvement in the original way back survey. Okay. Okay. Further complicating things. Um. Okay. Uh. I don't really see any strong majorities either way. So I guess I'm looking at us tabling this with more legal information for the whole bunch of it is if any, if anyone has any objections to that um raise your hand otherwise hopefully we'll come back with the project proponent here with us to answer questions and more legal information for our options I, 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 I don't i don't know what more information is going to do for us more than what we have now we have a simple request for an extension of time under for two years under the old rules. It seems to me that they could use their time between now and August 8 to put a new proposal together and get it to us. And, um, and that proposal would have current information about all the things that we have jurisdiction over under the new rules. And that would put it in 
in their bailiwick to to inform the commission. And so far, we've just been relying on Aaron and talking amongst ourselves. And I, I would really like to put the onus on them. Okay, you stop short in making the motion before. Do you want to make a motion? Yeah, and I, okay, I move that provided we're on solid legal ground, that we deny the extension of time for lot five, six, seven, eight, and Amherst Hills, and invite the applicant to refile under current rules. I would okay. second that. Okay, voice vote, great, no, uh, Alex. Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Okay, Aye. I'm going to stop. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I mean, so what we're going to do now is we're going to deny, uh, basically we're denying these um, uh, this extension. And that's what you're proposing. Is that correct, Alex? Provided we're on legal ground inviting them to come back under current rules. I, I get it. Um, I don't think that we're in a position to make that uh, decision without hearing from the legal people. You, we can't we can't say if we're in, uh, you know, if we're on, we stand on uh, good ground, we're going to do this. It, it I, I can't. I can't be there. Um, it's not, uh, we need to hear from the legal people first, and then we can propose what to do with that once we have that knowledge. I, I, what I, what makes most sense to me, Alex, uh, and Jason and everybody is to uh, ask for those legal, uh, that legal advice mm -hmm. and currently table this until the next, uh, until the next meeting. I personally am prepared to say no on uh, Amherst Hills, um, but uh, if if tabling it to the next uh, meeting, um, I, I have no problem tabling it to the next meeting. But I don't, I don't, I really don't want to vote on an if uh, on a. <clears throat> I don't want to say that if we are on legal grounds. Uh, yes, I can, I can't do that, Alex. Okay, Jason. Just out of curiosity, do we have any idea? You know, we're going to ask for potential. I, I, after Andre spoke, I, I agree with him. We can't just say we're going to do this if this happens and this if this other thing happens. Um, it appears this runs out though, or it expires August eighth. It's the middle of June. Um, if they, if we table this to the next. Uh, meeting and we don't have a legal opinion by that point, then we just keep tabling it. Are we effectively, I mean, does that sit well with everybody too then? like We can get a legal opinion very easily before the next meeting. Um, okay. And All right. I, then I'm fine with, then I'm fine with waiting. Laura. I was going to say, I agree with Andre. I am, um, uh, you know, I, I, agree with the desire you know i just think you can't um say reject but then not have the legal advice beforehand i think it could put the conservation commission in a bad position so i uh, i i support tabling until we have a legal opinion alex i heard aaron say we have great discretion on approving and denying extensions of time i think her those were her words we have great discretion I'm not quite sure what the legal questions are associated with approving or denying an extension of time. I don't either. Um, is it because of this implication of take with the wetland? Like if it comes into our new regulations, then we're walking into that ground. Is that what we're tipping, tiptoeing around right here? Okay, again, I mean, Amherst Hills doesn't have that implication. <laughs> I would love to get that one off the table. Um, but I'm fine with tabling and coming back with like legal opinions that would clarify everything for everybody and, you know, make it easier for us to move forward on some decision. Bruce. Uh, just to remind. Bruce, you're frozen. 
Say again, please. Sorry. We've already decided not to have a meeting on August 7th. And these expire August 8th. So I'm just reminding that the actual deadline is for deciding something is probably two weeks before that in July. I think that's fine. And we also okay. can arrange, I, mean, I think we can also arrange emergency sessions if we have to. Um, Laura. Okay. I'm just not sure how the fact that a permit expires on August 8th has any bearing on us. I mean, we're just getting this in front of us right now. Um, you know, in a perfect world, it would have been six months ago, but kind of not our problem. Um, and I think the question for me as a legal question is, uh, you know, can we say you have to be under the new bylaws or not? Um, I think that's the question that I would like to have answered before we move by the way. So I know you're trying to wrap this up, Michelle. I'm going to stop commenting. It's it's a very complicated situation. I think if we deny it, then they have to come back with a new NOI and they would be under new bylaws, but I don't see us making it a condition of the extension that they be under the new bylaws, unless Aaron, you think that our just, we could do that, you're saying? No. no. Yeah, you, right. You can't so, say we're extending it, but you're under the new bylaws. Exactly. That's so not... the only way oh, I didn't to say move that. us, I, I, okay, I didn't know if that was unclear. It's just the only way to make that happen is to deny this and have them come back with you anyways. Andre. Uh, you know, uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times. I think we can um, kind of whittle this down a little bit and uh, vote on uh, Amherst Hills. I'm, I could do that. I'm ready to do that. If uh, others are ready to do that, I could, I could just make a motion on that. Thanks, Andre. I'm going to ask for last staff comment, hopefully, before we get there, in case it's informative to this. Go ahead, so Aaron. There's a motion on the table that was seconded. Uh, Right. Oh, there was okay. no vote taken on the motion. We we need to either vote vote it down, vote it up, or withdraw the motion and start over. Okay. Alex made the motion. Alex, do you want to have us go through the vote, or do you want to withdraw it? Uh, first, I want to say that out of fairness to the applicant, um, because they they need if they were to put a new document together, they need time to do it. And so uh, out of fairness to the applicant, I think they deserve an answer tonight. And I would like to amend my motion if that's possible. I know it's been seconded. So what do I do? Withdraw it and remake it? You can um, amend it after our discussion. So yeah. And yeah. whomever makes, whoever seconded can, can second the amended motion or not. So I would amend the motion by dropping the condition that they refile under current rules. Can you repeat what the actual motion was? I would move that we deny the extension of time for lot four, five, six, uh, five, six, seven, eight in Amherst Hills. Period. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Jason, you had that second. Yes, I would. <clears throat> I would second that motion. Okay. Um, Alex. Aye. Aye. Aaron, is your hand still up? Okay. Jason. Aye. Andre. Nay. Bruce. Um, I don't know. Uh, Laura. Nay. Uh, I'll vote against it since I don't know. Laura. Can you repeat the motion, please? Can you repeat the motion? The motion is to deny the request for extensions of order condition for all lots, which I'm not sure if we can bundle them, but lots five through eight. Five through eight. So and Amherst Hills. Not included. And Amherst Hills. Well, was Amherst Hills included in the motion? I didn't have that. Bruce, yeah. do you have that? That was my uh, understanding from okay. Alex. Okay, I missed it. Mine also. Okay, does that <laughs> clears mine? So motion is to deny the request for extensions of order conditions for lot five, six, seven, eight, and the Amherst Hills subdivision. Laura, you're muted if you're 
talking. Sorry, uh, nay. Okay, I'm also a nay. Um, I didn't keep track there. I think the nays have this. Okay. Does anyone else want to put forth a motion? <laughs> I'll put forward a, a, a motion to deny the uh, request for extension of orders of conditions on Amherst Hill DEP number 0890432. I'll second that motion. So under the motion, Jason, second. Alex? Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, motion passes to deny the extension of orders conditions for the Amherst Hills. We're going to table lots five, six, seven, eight pending legal <laughs> counsel from Aaron, and we'll put it on the agenda for June 26th. Okay. Whew. All right. Um Enforcement compliant updates, NOI for the pavilion project, Erin. <laughs> we received a notice of intent for the pavilion project um, and uh, we'll, it'll be on for our next meeting on the 26th. Okay, parcel 9C31, DEP, DEP complaint. Um, so this is the off North East Street abutting Pelham lot, which um, there is some alleged illegal caching of fill on this property. Um, and Aaron says update from staff. So yeah, we're just at an impasse with this one. Um, so I don't really ha have any update to share, but just that there's not really been any evidence presented in terms of pictures or anything. And um where without a warrant the the owner is refusing to allow us to enter the property so um it's until there's some evidence to proceed we're kind of stuck alex uh i need to step away for a minute and i'll be right back okay andre yeah what um what's the address again um it's a um, sorry, it was in the last round of packets. It's um, parcel 9C-31. It's the, there was a large logging operation off of Northeast Street um, where Rifle Range Road comes in off of Northeast Street going towards Pelham. Um, there's, there was a forest cutting plan back there. Um, there was a lot of issues associated with this one um, in that the, service forester signed off a final inspection on the permit after there had been some inappropriate or unpermitted wetlands crossings that hadn't been reviewed by the commission, which we should have been informed of, but we're not. Um, and then after the fact, we found out about this after the fact, after this complaint had come in that there had been filling of ditches um, uh, in the access roads. Um, but this... the, we had Sorry, been, this... I'd been coordinating with the Pelham Conservation Commission to try to get um, permission to access for a site visit and the landowner denied um, access. So um, that's the issue. Yeah, we can't do Is anything. this on the uh, north side of uh, Rifle Range Road? As yes. you're going in toward the, uh, toward the uh, river? North, the north, south, and east of rifle range road yes um yeah. so before you cross before you get to the river crossing the bridge um before so on the amherst side and on the pelham side over opposite adams brook it was a huge cut um extending all the way up almost to like the properties south of shootsbury road um mm -hmm. abutting mm -hmm. on the they were on the east side of the adams brook as well as the west side both sides of the brook okay Thanks. Okay. Um, Trillium Way. Okay. Um, cool. Trillium Way. Probably quickly Way. we could, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the applicant was cooperative with the commission's asks as far as a planting plan and um, coming up with some kind of bounding 
um, they were going to get back to me with a plan. I, I did get a response this afternoon, but I have not read the response. It came in bef like 4.30 or something. So I didn't get a chance to read it, to review it and, and share it with the board. So they have been responsive and wanting to be cooperative, just don't have anything to share with you tonight because it didn't get in on time. Okay. So, so that Alex, that was Trillium. Um, recall that we gave them a choice to file an NOI or submit a planting restoration plan. So they're doing the latter and they submitted something to Aaron today. So um, we haven't had a chance to review it and I guess we'll review it for the next meeting. Uh, Wildflower Drive. Um, okay, Wildflower. Um, so the, the letter went to the owner of Wildflower from our town attorney um, telling them that they had to, to respond to our request, to our enforcement order. The landowner had been through four different environmental wetlands consultants to try to find somebody to take the project. They've finally found somebody who can do it. Um, I've confirmed with that individual that they are willing to work with it, with the owner. They are just waiting to go under contract with the owner. The owner informed me that they have a surveyor who they have retained to um, do the survey once the wetland delineation has been verified. Um, and the owner requested in writing an extension to allow him additional time to, to continue. I am in favor of that with the condition that prior to the next meeting, they provide some evidence to us that they have in fact retained the surveyor and the wetland individual or the wetland professional who's doing the work and also provide a date of when the anticipated notice of intent filing will come through. Okay, yes, and we were going to have an executive session for that tonight, but because of the new developments, we are not going to have that, but to reserve the right to have that next time in case um, said actions are not done, uh, we will, am I missing something, Erin? We're just nope. going to need a motion to schedule the executive session for the next meeting. Correct. So, um, right, to reserve our ability to talk about that in an executive session. Um, if uh, progress is not made up to our request, I'm looking for a motion to schedule an executive session for 726 at our next meeting. 726 PM? Sorry, June 26. Okay. Uh, yeah, do I need a time or anything, Erin? Is okay. Um, no, just so long as the executive session is scheduled pursuant to MGL Chapter Thirty A, Section Twenty One A Three, there um, it is to discuss Wildflower Drive, um, Map Twenty One D, Lot Sixteen. I will move to schedule the executive session pursuant to MGL uh, Section Thirty A, Thirty A, Section Twenty One A Three on 6 26 2024 second based on the motion andre on the second alex aye jason aye andre aye bruce aye rachel aye laura aye no and i okay do we do it Go, we got one more, which is the emergency oh. cert. Oh, right. Okay. Yes. And it's not. Okay. Do you, did everybody get a chance to look at pictures? Um, if you have any questions about this. So this is on, this is within the Hickory Ridge area. Yes. And yep, 191 West Pomeroy. Yep. Um, a beaver dam is causing ponding on either side of West Pomeroy Road. So it's my understanding, just to get into specifics here, that the the level of the water is still currently 10 to 12 feet below the road, and that this emergency is a preemptive to a flooding event. So 
this is a tricky one because, you know, that might be an inevitability, but as an emergency, you know, is there, is there a current public safety and health emergency um, per this beaver pond or beaver dam and current water levels? So I'm just throwing that out there because um, beavers are generally seem to be dealt through emergency certifications. Um, I'm not suggesting we not do this. I'm just sort of calling attention to this sort of de facto process of dealing with beavers. Jason. Yeah, what, uh, can we be more specific? It's hard to, like these pictures are good pictures of water seen standing, uh, yeah. but I have no idea where this is. As far as like it, West Palm, is this like West Pomeroy Lane uh Palm Brook going like where Muddy Brook. specifically Unmute. Yeah, muddy it's Muddy Brook. Um and I can zoom into the location so you can see where it's located if you bear with me just a moment. I mean, I I guess I just to follow up on what I just how I presented this that as we've done before with this previous one, I would just strongly suggest an emotion including um, the condition that a longer term strategy is is looked into with Beaver Solutions to have some kind of water control structure or flow structure um, rather than just sort of addressing this uh, emergency cert by emergency cert. Um, mm -hmm because it's going to keep happening and the the process for doing this is going to involve the removal of forested wetland vegetation with a rush hog and that and will enable the um, heavy equipment to go in there and excavate the beaver mound so it's it's not just someone hand pulling sticks it's um it's kind of an operation um right so i just would hope that someone would like to include some kind of uh, reminder and uh, condition that this in particular, because it's gonna be recurring, has a beaver solutions in like feasibility study done for um, flow control structures. Alex. Yeah, just for the, for the commission edification, the term emergency in, under the law it does not mean the house is burning um that it's not an emergency in the usual sense of the word it it um it it calls for quick action but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's danger or um um uh, an emergency it just means that there is good cause Okay, thanks for clarifying that, Alex. So it's it's a public health or safety emergency is the criteria when an emergency certification can be issued under the law. It's got to be a public health or safety emergency. Right, and there's a whole list of what, in, under the law, there's a whole list of the kinds of things that are warranted. Andre. So just to clarify again, this is a we're, we're we're looking to ratify an emergency certification for something that's for an emergency that hasn't occurred yet. Is that what we're I, doing? I mean, am I? I mean, I I don't, I want to walk back if I gave it that slant. I think that. Uh... Can I? Would it be okay? Yeah. If I... Go ahead. Okay. So, um, the. DPW contacted uh, Dave Zomek and I with concern that there's water backing up on either side of um, West Pomeroy Lane. There's a series of beaver dams um, on the north side of West Pomeroy. Um, Muddy Brook flows in from the south in the direction of the north. And um, just immediately to the north, I want to say like maybe 30 feet in from the road, there is a a beaver dam but then as you move in there's sort of a series of beaver dams going into the property um the concern was that you know uh, 
the the water level was ponding that it, the stream wasn't flowing um and that it it could potentially flood um, west pomeroy lane and cause a problem so um a an emergency certification was requested Dave Zomek um, approved the emergency certification with conditions. There was a, a list of, of conditions that were associated with it, which I am happy to pull up to share with you guys. And um, the, um, the emergency cert was issued to DPW last Friday. Um, the emergency certification process requires that the Conservation Commission ratify it. So, um, that's generally the process, but the commission, the work hasn't taken place yet, to the best of my knowledge, um, because I'm supposed to be there when it happens. And so if the commission has additional conditions that are beyond what has already been outlined, you're more than welcome to, to add those conditions to the permit. Um, these are the conditions, um, and I can just run through them quickly. Um, so... Um, I'm actually going to take this down there. I, I don't, <laughs> there's, there's turtles on the property. I'm not going to, I don't want to disclose what the turtles are, but there's turtles on the property. And so we've got to be cautious because it is turtle reading. State, state protected turtles. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let me just, I'm just going to, there on, it's in your OneDrive folder, but um, uh, the idea is to limit machinery in the location as much as possible, but the, what we had discussed using was rather than a brush hog driving in using an over the um, guardrail mower style to mow back the forest that's leading up to the the beaver dam and that um, once that's done Beth and I would go in and sweep the area for turtles um, and uh, that uh, they would not cut super low, but try to keep the vegetation to some degree. And then once it's been swept, that a piece of heavy machinery would drive out to the location of the beaver dam and breach it gradually um, to draw down the water that's backing up. And that the applicant would have to contact Beaver Solutions to evaluate a long-term solution. And also that Natural Heritage would have to sign off on it as well. Thanks, Aaron. Bruce? Is it completely ridiculous to say that it would be possible to do this by hand? Or would it cause more damage because you'd have all these people out there doing stuff? Um, I think it would be precarious to do it by hand. <laughs> okay. Precarious and potentially not safe to do by hand. I think it would be very difficult. There's, okay. there's it's an actual dam, like a beaver dam with the mud and the beaver living inside of it, or not just a, I mean, um, like a no, lodge no, or a, a dam. It's not a lodge, it's a okay, dam. It's a dam. Yeah, I mean, I've um, hand pulled those before. It's not impossible. <laughs> oh, really? Interesting. Oh, yeah. That's like wildlife tech days. Um, Alex, did you have your hand up to Jason? I did, but you know, it, my question is just more. I think you somewhat clarified it. So the beaver, nothing's happening with the beaver itself, but ultimately what's, what's the long-term solution here? Like what are, but I, you know, you mentioned Aaron that the beaver solutions is going to evaluate the long-term solution. Um, why this is going to be done over several days. If it is a breeding season, why not just do it all at once? Do, Would that be catastrophic? Breach, breach the, the um, dam all at once? Yeah. Why do it over two to three days during a breeding season with a potentially, or with, with a, with a, you know, in a yeah. There? yeah, no, I think that's, it's a great question, Jason. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like saying we're going to um, avoid impacts to the turtle, but potentially cause resource area damage upstream and downstream. So it, it's a tough, it's a tough question. Um, if you release a dam quickly, what happens is the, the animals that have become um, 
uh, adapted to living upstream in the in the flooded conditions are going to get swept downstream and potentially you know um, disrupted relocated um, etc and also there's potential for scouring and you know resource area damage and flooding downstream um, in this you know downstream of butters being one and potentially um, you know resource area damage as well so usually doing it slowly is advisable but is there not a series of dams downstream there are <laughs> uh, it's tough to tell what a, a, a you know removing the dam all at once would do um in terms of the the dams downstream and how much water those are holding so what could happen and i'm playing devil's advocate here but let's say you do a, a massive release and the water goes flowing down it could blow out the dams downstream and you know all of those impoundments could be breached at once which could have more of a, a good idea yeah how long is this been, like is this something that just and this is more curiosity as yeah it's like how long does it take for one of these things to be constructed like to just pop up like that or has it been you know months that this thing is being built and somebody just noticed it um <clears throat> I know that the beavers have been active in this area for probably the last, I don't know, six months or so. I know there was a large beaver that was hit on West Pomeroy because it was reported to me that it had been hit by a car. Um, and I do know that they've had, DPW has had quite a bit of issues with debris, like stick debris blocking the culvert coming under West Pomeroy, which, you know, under their maintenance requirements they can remove material from the culverts themselves if they become blocked which could you know plug up the culvert going under the road and cause a really serious problem and damage the culverts so they i know that there have been and and also we've we've seen hickory flooding um in the muddy brook um upstream of the confluence with the, the fort river so we know it's happening i think it's been sort of a balancing act for staff to know that there's beavers in there and, you know, um, be understanding of the fact that they're, they're moving into this native habitat of theirs and, and um, taking advantage of it versus trying to protect town infrastructure. So it's kind of been, um, you know, trying to, trying to work with them, but at the same time, trying to protect the infrastructure. Okay. I'm being mindful of the time here. Um, it looks like we already have a nice order of conditions that you put together. So thank you for being mindful of that, uh, Alex. Yeah, first of all, there's in is the beaver house in the first in the impoundment that you want to breach? I I don't know the answer to that. the The beaver dam is located within a very thick forested, um, vegetated area, so there may be a lodge downstream from it. But I also know that there has been some documentation that the beavers are actually not in a stick lodge, but they are nesting in the banks of the Fort River. So I can't say definitively which, you know, okay. where the beavers are nesting. So this is a matter of the biology. There's usually three generations of beavers present. And um, uh, so the pups, the, the young have already been born, born and they're pretty good sized by now. But my, the reason I've raised my hand is to ask, why not bring beaver solutions in first? and get their advice on how they might be able to manage the water level so that they don't uh, um, put the road in, uh, so they don't flood the road and rather than breach the dam because the beavers will rebuild what you rip out overnight. And uh, if beaver solutions can do something to maintain the water levels uh, without you having to go in and, and brush hog and put heavy equipment in there, uh, why not go that route first? Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair condition or suggestion to add to the permit for approval. Okay, yeah, given it doesn't seem to be absolutely imminent, if that's possible, I mean, they're probably pretty busy right now. Um, Rachel. Um, yeah, I just was noting that we're supposed to have a really heavy rain on Friday, so I don't know if that creates a more urgent situation but Alex, if they can build it overnight, um, it, it, that that might be a difficult challenge without the input of other people. And um, some turtles, not saying which kind, um, beavers are actually the biggest threat to their habitat. 
So um, it'd be interesting. I don't know if Natural Heritage has something to say about managing beavers in best turtle habitat, or, or if you guys know more about that. This type of turtle, yeah. a lot of the bank. And to complicate things further, some turtles um, are likely to be federally listed soon, and this is going to become a, an additional complexity in talking about beavers and Hickory Ridge and all of these things. So stay tuned. Okay, um, good beaver discussion. <laughs> I think we still need to ratify the emergency certification. We talked about maybe expediting the beaver solution consultation, if at all possible. Um, though given the rain, they might need to just do this. Anyway, looking for a motion unless there's any further discussion. Um, where are we? Uh, looking for a motion to ratify the emergency certification issue to the Department of Public Works for parcel 27B-25 with um, noted changes to conditions. I'd like to move that the emergency cert be amended to require consultation with Beaver Solutions prior to um, I want to say dam removal, but whatever words work. Okay, are you ratifying at the same time, or you, what? I think we need a ratification in there, unless you're specifically not doing that. No, I could move to ratify it with amendment. Okay. All right. So you want the word ratify in there? I think that would be good. Okay. So I move to ratify the emergency cert with a condition that Beaver Solutions be engaged prior to altering the Beaver Dam. Second. Alex on the motion, Andre in the second. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Laura? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. I'll give it a couple seconds for those who held on. Some big discussions tonight. Um, I'm seeing none. And Aaron just confirming that we've addressed everything. Yes? on the agenda yeah. um oh my gosh sorry my computer is going haywire um i believe we have covered everything i did um send a letter to um the wagners regarding the forest cutting plan requesting site access um and i have not heard a response on that yet so that's outstanding but um other than that i think that's everything okay um all right I'm seeing Move to adjourn. Uh, before we adjourn, I have a question about the cutting plan. We, yes. we, Aaron, we've had that request in front of Wagner for a couple of meetings, haven't we? The new development is that there has been a letter written in conjunction with the town attorney delivered to them requesting uh, site access. So it, it's been an additional step towards <clears throat> pursuing okay. that. Uh, Okay, uh, I'll talk to Aaron offline. All right, so we have a motion on the table to adjourn. Second. Andre on the motion, Alex on the second. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Laura? Aye. Mm -hmm. I'm an aye. All right, thanks everyone. And uh, have a nice rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good Bye, day. everyone. Thanks. Stay well.